the Holocaust Living History Workshop. It's really wonderful to see such a, a big audience. And I was already um, pleasantly surprised at 3 o'clock when uh, we started showing the film uh, based on the life of, or on the literary activity of Hava Rosenfarb. And there were at least 50 people here. And I think that really showed that there is something about Yiddish culture and Yiddish literature that um, keeps interesting people. So that's, that's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I would like to uh, welcome uh, our students. Um, I'm very pleased to see there's so many here. The students who are in Professor Deborah Hertz's uh, History 136 and also my own students who are currently learning about nationalism <coughs> and the dangers of an exclusionary nationalism. So I thought it would be good to um, welcome them to attend and see what can happen if nationalism is carried too far. So welcome to you. I would uh, also like to thank um, a few people. Uh, Don Harrison of the San Diego Jewish Journal. Um, he first brought Goldie Morgenthaler to my attention. And I have to admit, I had not heard about her before. I'm not a Yiddishist. But after seeing this film, I really want to read her books. So thank you, Don. I also would like to uh, thank uh, Mark Kazimatis, who has been our tech wizard. He's not here today, but without him, we realized today we couldn't function. And thank you, Dan Lasusa, who has been uh, filming or taping our events for uh, several years now, and he's, he's a great um, videographer. I would now like to uh, particularly thank our sponsor, uh, Lorraine Ratner, who has graciously <laughs> decided to support this event. And not only that, she has been um, a faithful supporter and an inspiring supporter of our program for several years. So I'm very glad that she made it today, even though she's not feeling well, but uh, hopefully this event kind of revives you. <laughs> uh, I also want to acknowledge the support of um, a UCSD Humanities Center working group, Revolutions and Their Aftermath. Uh, they have contributed to this event. And of course, our regular supporters, those who make this program possible, uh, Jewish Studies and the UC San Diego Library. Obviously, we couldn't do what we're doing without all that support. Uh, now, one quick announcement uh, before I uh, invite uh, Professor Amelia Glazer to introduce our speaker. Our last event of the year um, is a talk by the renowned um, Israeli historian and journalist Tom Segev. And uh, if you, well, if you came in through the front door, you probably saw some flyers. I would like you to um, take one of them and uh, please note that you need to register. The event will take place on June 1st. It's free and open to the public, but we do ask you to register. It's going to take place in another venue, not in the Seuss room. And now um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Amelia Glazer, who is a specialist in Yiddish and much the best person to introduce Goldie Morgenthal. Suzanne for um, organizing this and for making this happen. Um, it's always a pleasure to have a, um, a room this packed um, at an event at UCSD. It's an especial pleasure uh, to see so many people coming out to hear a translator speak. It should always be this way. Translators are, um, as Pushkin said, the workhorses of literature, the people who bring great world literature to us. But it's uh, an even more particular pleasure to see a room fill up for a Yiddish translator, um, a language, a really important language of uh, modern literature, uh, not to mention of the modern Jewish experience, especially, of course, the modern Jewish experience in the 20th century in Europe. So it's it's my great honor to, uh, to welcome Professor Goldie Morgenthaler, and she's going to be speaking. The title of her talk is Chava Rosenfarb's The Tree of Life, an epic about life in the Woods Ghetto. Uh, and I'm going to just say a couple of things first about our speaker and then about uh, Hava Rosenfarb, uh, the speaker's late mother and the author of the book that will be the, the um, centerpiece of tonight's lecture. First of all, Goldie Morgenthaler is a translator, not only from Yiddish, but also from French into English. She has translated, in addition to Hava Rosenfarb, uh, Yid Lamed Peretz, perhaps the greatest of the modern Yiddish writers, a Yiddish writer who's centennial of his death is being celebrated this year. Um, she's also a professor of English literature. Um, she's translated The Tree of Life, a trilogy of life in the Wuj Ghetto, 
uh, Survivors, Seven Short Stories, and this is a uh, series of short stories, a book that won a couple of different prizes, the Jewish Book Award in Canada, as well as the uh, MLA's uh, Levant Prize, which Goldie just reminded me we actually shared in 2006. Um, so quite an, an additional honor for me. Um, she's also, in addition to her translation work, a scholar and expert in uh, Dickens, and is the author of a book, Dickens and Heredity, When Like Begets Like. Um, so just a couple of words about Hava Rosenfarb, and I brought, I grabbed on my way out of my office, my copy of Hava Rosenfarb's Bochani, which is a book that I taught a few years ago when I taught Yiddish, modern Yiddish literature on this campus. Um, she, uh, was really one of the, uh, uh, is and kind of remains one of the most recent writers of modern secular fiction in Yiddish, a, um, a phenomenal writer in, um, in her own right, someone who writes um, beautiful prose, who writes prose that describes the experience of, of Jews and especially of Jewish women, um, and her writing about World War II and about the period before World War II um, is particularly gripping. When I did teach sections of this book to our students, they, um, they loved it. They, um, many of them went on to write final papers about it, midterm papers about it. Um, so it was, um, it's Yiddish, many view as a language that is a sort of long dead language, quite incorrectly. It's a language that actually continues to be written in. It certainly continues to be spoken. Um, but uh, more recently, uh, it's spoken by um, uh, religious communities and less by uh, secular communities of Jews who are writing things like you know novels that deal with everyday experiences that are read by Jews and non-Jews. Um, so it's a really great pleasure to have Goldie with us today to tell us more about this book, to give us um, her insights both as a scholar of literature and as a translator of her mother's work. And with that, I welcome Golden Rock College. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Amelia for the lovely introduction. And I would also like to thank uh, Suzanne Hillman for inviting me to take part in this Holocaust lecture series and also Lorraine Ratner uh, for sponsoring it, and especially my friend Donald Harrison and his wife Nancy for facilitating today's talk and for hosting me and my husband um, while we are in San Diego. Thank you very much. Eva <laughs> Rosenfarb was a writer of the past, of her own past and that of the Jews of Poland. For her, the past meant specifically Jewish, Yiddish-speaking Poland, the Poland that she saw disappear before her eyes during the five long years that she spent in the Lodge ghetto and the final year in the concentration camps. She was a writer of the past, and she was also a writer with a mission. That mission was to recreate the lost world of Polish Jewry in her novels to chronicle and memorialize a community that no longer existed because it had been annihilated. All three of Rosenfarb's novels, The Tree of Life, Bochani, and Letters to Abrasha, are set in Poland, the country of her birth, and specifically in the city of Lodz, her hometown. Like the Holocaust survivor in one of uh, her Montreal-based short stories, who, when asked why he had left Poland, replies, I am still there. Rosenfarb, in her imagination, remained in Poland. She was still there. Not only are all her novels set in Poland, they all deal with the Holocaust in one way or another. Since Chava Rosenfarb wrote a great deal, short stories, essays, poetry, and three novels, I've decided to focus my talk today on her epic three-volume novel, The Tree of Life, which deals with life in the Lodz ghetto during the time of the Holocaust. But before I turn to her work, I would like to tell you a little about the author herself. She was born in the Polish city of Lodz in 1923, the elder of two daughters of Abraham Rosenfarb, a restaurant waiter. 
Lodz was at the time the second largest city in Poland after Warsaw. Her mother worked in a textile factory as a stoperke, which means someone who mends faults in fabric. Both of Rosenfarb's parents originally came from the small town of Koinsk. And Koinsk, if I can get to work, it doesn't work. Koinsk is, as you can see, Krakow is at the uh, bottom, this map of Poland. Koinsk is right near Krakow, and I also want you just to notice where Lodz is, uh, almost in the middle and uh, not that far from Warsaw. A very important city, certainly before the Second World War, uh, not so much anymore. Um, the father's side of the family uh, traced its descent from Reb Yoinus and Ibushitz, a famous rabbi who had opposed the false messiah, Shabtzai Tzvi, in the 17th century. Chava was very proud of the fact that she descended from a famous rabbi. It gave her yichis, that is, pride in the blessing of an illustrious heritage. It also underlined the family's long years of residence in Poland. Chava's parents both migrated from the town of Koinski, which is, as I said, near Krakow, to Lodz to find work in the factories of that great industrial city. There they married, and Chava and her younger sister Henya were both born in Lodz. And that's Chava on the left, and her sister is the baby. Her father began his working life as a weaver in a factory. But because he was an unusually good-looking man, he landed a job as a waiter in a restaurant that catered to the literary and political clientele. And this was his job when Kava, his firstborn child, was born. She later published fictional, a fictional account of the early lives of, and courtship of both her parents in the novels Bochani, um, that Emilia just mentioned, and of Lodge and Love. Chava's parents were active in the Jewish Socialist Bund, the left-leaning Jewish political movement that had an enormous following among working-class Jews in Eastern Europe. In the period between the two wars, the Bund was a major cultural and political force in Poland, where it elected representatives to the city council in the larger cities. Bundist ideology encouraged agitation for equal rights for Jews in Poland, where there was rampant anti-Semitism, with restrictions on Jews in higher education and the professions. The Bund also incorporated a strong cultural element that privileged Yiddish as the language of the Jewish masses. So Chava and her sister were educated in Yiddish at a Bundes school. One of the other students at this school was Henek Morgenthaler, the son of Joseph Morgenthaler, a Bundes representative to the city council of Lodz. Chava married Henjek Morgenthaler after the war in Belgium in 1949. When they emigrated to Canada in 1950, he changed his name to Henry and became famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, in Canada as a crusader and the prime mover behind the fact that uh, Canada does not have an abortion law. But I'm getting ahead of myself. To return to Kaaba. While her elementary school education had been all in Yiddish, her high school education was in Polish. Although the school she attended was funded by Jews and its uh, student body was Jewish. She attended this school for five years, both before and after the outbreak of the war. By the time she graduated, she was already incarcerated in the Lodz ghetto. While still a child, Chava had shown a talent for writing, producing countless poems which her father proudly showed off to the patrons of the restaurant where he worked. <coughs> she later claimed that she became a writer on the day that she first learned to hold a pencil in her hand. But she became a Holocaust writer on February 8, 1940, one day before her 17th birthday, when she, her family, and the entire Jewish population of Lodz was herded into a ghetto. There she wrote, 
The nightmare of my early life began in earnest. And it is this nightmare of incarceration in the Lodge ghetto that became the subject of her three-volume novel, The Tree of Life. The Nazis had established the ghetto in the city of Lodz in 1940, herding the Jews into one of the city's slums called Baluti, which they encircled with barbed wire. As a photo of the Jews actually going into the ghetto. <coughs> Hava's family was housed in a tiny apartment with only a kitchen and a bedroom. She and her sister slept in the kitchen on chairs and a sofa. It was from this bed of chairs that she would rise every morning at dawn to write poems before going to work at her various ghetto jobs. Another photo. Yeah, this is the same scene of the Jews uh, being marched into the ghetto. Her poetry brought Chava to the attention of Sim Simchabunim Shayevich, the great ghetto poet and author of the epic poem Lech Lecha, about whom, if you saw the film, she mentions quite a bit. She became Shayevich's protege, and it was he who introduced her to the writer's group of the Lodz ghetto, who quickly recognized her talent and accepted her at age 17 as their youngest member. When the ghetto was liquidated in August 1944, Hava and her family were deported to Auschwitz. There she was separated from her father, whom she never saw again. From Auschwitz, Hava, her mother and sister were transported to the forced labor camp at Zazel on the outskirts of Hamburg, where they built houses for the bombed out Germans of that city. As the allies approached, Hava, her mother and sister were again transported, this time to Bergen-Belsen, where they were liberated by the British army in April of 1945. In 1950, she emigrated to Canada and settled in Montreal. Given her experiences during the war, it's not surprising that the Holocaust hovers over Hava Rosenfarb's work like a malignant shadow. The genesis of the Tree of Life actually began at Auschwitz, and I'm going to read Hava's own description. When we disembarked at Auschwitz, I stood on the station platform with my knapsack on my back, one arm embracing my father. I held a bundle of poems that I'd written in the ghetto under the other arm. A capo tore the bundle from under my arm and tossed it into a heap of discarded prayer books, letters, and photographs. The men were separated from the women, and my father was ordered to join the line of men. That was the last I ever saw of him. Then came the selection. My mother, my sister, and I were sent off through the gate with the inscription, Arbeit macht frei. Soon I stood naked with my head shaved, but my life spared. It was then that the thought of one day writing a book about the Lodz ghetto, <coughs> that is, if I survived, flickered for a moment across my mind. In fact, it was not until Chava was settled in Brussels immediately after the war that the real work on the novel began. <coughs> At the same time, she was writing poetry, and her first published books were collections of poems. Between 1947 and 1965, she published four volumes of poetry in Yiddish. She also wrote plays, and her play, The Bird of the Ghetto, was translated into Hebrew, and performed in Israel by the Habima in 1966. Feeling, however, that neither poetry nor drama could adequately express everything she wanted to say about her experiences during the Holocaust, she concentrated most of her literary energies on writing The Tree of Life, which was finally published in Yiddish in 1972. The Tree of Life is a massive three-volume work that chronicles the, the annihilation of the Jews of Lodz. Because the subject is so vast, the structure of the novel, its breadth and scope are vast as well. The Tree of Life is in fact an epic, 
a chronicle of the destruction of the second largest Jewish community in the world before the war, numbering over 200,000 souls. Only Warsaw had more Jews. That this community was also intimately known to the author, who had been one of its members, lends both an urgency and an authenticity to the novel. And this is a picture of the Lodz ghetto with the bridge that, um, that connected the two sides of the ghetto. Beneath it was Main Street, and you can see a German soldier um, on the bottom. And if you wanted to go from one side of the ghetto to the other, you had to cross this wooden bridge. It became a symbol of the ghetto. The Tree of Life presents in unflinching, precise, and often horrific detail the inner workings of the ghetto, the daily frustrations and humiliations of ghetto life. It chronicles the barbarous cruelty of the Nazis, the constant hunger of the inhabitants, barely relieved by concoctions made from turnips and potato peels. It chronicles torture, betrayal, and degradation. But it also documents the tenderness of human love despite these conditions. It illuminates the complexities of relationships between husbands and wives, parents and children, lovers and friends. It documents the political life of the ghetto and it describes the cultural life of the ghetto. The establishment of a library in a two-room flat attendance at concerts and plays, meetings of the writers' group, political agitation and resistance. And uh, Sorry, it's not a, a very good picture, but the original wasn't very good. This is a picture of Rumkowski, uh, he's right in the center, and I'm going to talk more about him. His girlfriend is to his right, and they're at a, a, the, a cultural presentation right in the ghetto. Most importantly, it, chronic, it peoples the ghetto with complex human beings whose individual stories make for compelling reading. In short, the Tree of Life provides as complete and authentic a portrait of what it was like to have lived and died in the Lodge ghetto as literature can. And in this way, it also demonstrates the extent to which fiction can tra both transcend and animate history. This is the cover. And you, you can see the same bridge in the cover. The narrative of the Tree of Life follows the fates of ten individuals from all walks of life who lived through the terrible events of the years 1939 to 44. The main characters include the <coughs> impoverished Ichimeyer, a carpenter with four sons, each of whom is a member of a different political party, as well as the wealthy Samuel Zuckerman, a rich factory owner before the war. There is the assimilationist Miss Diamond, a high school teacher and Polish patriot, <coughs> Esther, a great beauty and an ardent communist who has acted in the ghetto underground, and the doctor Michal Levine, who compulsively writes letters that he never sends to a woman he loved in Paris before the war. The most autobiographical characters are Rosenfarb's alter ego, Rachel Ibushitz, a politically committed high school student, and her boyfriend, David, diarist, who is modeled on Henrik Morgenthaler, the man who became Rosenfarb's husband. In addition to these central characters, the novel is replete with memorable secondary portraits. <coughs> so that the overall effect is of a community of individuals all responding in individual ways to the torments inflicted on them by powers that they can neither control nor propitiate. It is the incomprehensible cruelty and capriciousness of Nazi rule that make up a large part of the horror of what the Jews endure. The ever-decreasing rations of food permitted the ghetto inhabitants, the issuing of one evil decree after another. For all the complexity with which Rosenfarb depicts her Jewish characters, there is never any doubt that for her, the Nazis are the enemy. She is always aware of the beast at the door. 
While the focus of the Tree of Life is on the Jewish community of Lodz, the Nazis are not a shadowy presence in the novel. On the contrary, they appear as themselves, terrifying and all too human, enforcing barbaric decrees, shooting randomly into the ghetto as if it were a fish pond. In one particularly chilling instance, they shoot a young boy sitting near a water pump, quietly reading on a very hot day because he has removed his shirt with its identifying star of David. Several of the characters in the Tree of Life are based on actual people, which makes the novel both an imaginative and a factual recreation. Among the most significant of these are Rosenfarb's mentor, the poet Simchabunin Shai Evich, whose long poem, Lech Lecha, was found on a garbage heap in the ruins of the large ghetto after the war. And the, sec the man standing in the back, second from the left, is Shai Evich. Uh, this photo dates from, I think, the 1920s. It's a nice looking guy. The Tree of Life supplies some of the only available information of what is known of Shaevich's life in the ghetto. Shaevich appears in fictionalized form under the name Simchabunim Berkovich. And then there is the one historical character whose name is not changed from what it really was, Modre Chaim Rumkowski, the so-called eldest of the Jews, the de facto king of the Lodz ghetto. Rumkowski is one of the novel's most powerful and ambiguous creations, a self-styled savior of the Jews, who nevertheless aided the Nazis in sending tens of thousands of Jews to their deaths. The Tree of Life describes the road that Rumkowski traveled from being the founder and director of the Helenovic orphanage in Lodz before the war to being the puppet leader of the ghetto put in place by the Nazis and compelled to do their bidding, even as he tried to save the ghetto. The Tree of Life is organized chronologically, which allows for a logical progression through time, even as each chapter concentrates on another major character. Book one begins with a New Year's Eve party at the home of the rich factory owner, Samuel Zuckerman shepherding in the year 1939. Among Zuckerman's guests are most of the characters whom we will meet again on more intimate terms in subsequent chapters and whose fates we will follow throughout the volumes three novels. Three, sorry, sorry, throughout the novels three volumes. Book one ends on New Year's Eve 1940, thus encompassing a year of extraordinary change in the fortunes of Lodge Jewry a year which sees the Nazis march into Poland and which signals the beginning of the end of the Jewish community of Lodz. By beginning her novel in the months before the Nazi invasion of September 1939, Rosenfarb allows readers to see what that community was like in normal times, when people still had the luxury of going about their daily activities when they could still experience the joys and sorrows of peaceful times, when they could still act out their social roles and assume their public faces. This first book of the trilogy thus gives a sense of what will be lost, of the vitality and creativity of this community, which within the space of a few short months will be reduced to fighting for the bare essentials of survival. The subsequent two books of the Tree of Life, each of which encompasses two years in the life of the ghetto, describe in vivid and meticulous detail the deterioration and dismantling of this once vibrant Jewish community. How the social masks are dropped in response to ever increasing hardship as the ghetto is established and random killings, starvation, disease, deportation and death become the norms. Each book of the trilogy depicts the noose tightening a little more. Book two begins with the establishment of the ghetto and ends with another New Year's Eve retrospective. Book three 
begins with the deportations from the ghetto, deportations that increase in intensity and number until the ghetto is finally liquidated. Because the narrative filters historical events through the experiences of its 10 characters, by the time we reach the last pages, the destruction of human life has become so personalized that it is difficult to avoid a sense of intimate loss as one after another of Rosenfarb's characters is sent out of the ghetto to a fate that we can imagine only too well. The chronological structure of the novel keeps readers tied to historical reality, even as the events in the lives of the characters spiral out of control. What Rosenfarb captures, perhaps too well because it is so painful to read, is the constant anxiety that permeated every aspect of ghetto life, an anxiety about never knowing if one would survive to the end of the day, if one's loved ones would survive, if one would make it through the Sperre, a period of enforced house arrest that resulted in the rounding up of children and old people, or if one would make it, if one would avoid the deportations was an anxiety brought on by ever harsher decrees and ever decreasing food rations. It is this basic anxiety about being able to live another day and having no control over one's fate, of being the sport in someone else's game, that gives this description of the Lodge Ghetto its nightmarish quality. And it is the psychological probing of what it is like to live with such an unrelieved sense of impending doom that is one of the novel's contributions to our understanding of the Holocaust. What the novel conveys most vividly is that intangible quality of atmosphere, an atmosphere of dread that permeated the life of the ghetto and contributes to the haunting quality of the novel. Added to this is the novel's vivid presentation of character, and the broad range of characters it chooses to depict, from the lowest classes to the highest, from the young to the old. Because the 10 major characters of the Tree of Life come from all walks of life, the novel recreates in all its complexity an entire Jewish ghetto community. In addition, it captures in detail the everyday life of the ghetto workshops and food distribution centers. And this is um, the, the uh, label says, uh, I think, um, Volks, Volkskoch, the Litzmannstadt Ghetto. Um, uh, it's March 1941. This is the, the um, kitchen. Um, the Nazis renamed the ghetto Litzmannstadt. They gave it a, they, uh, they gave it a, a German name. And I have a personal connection to this photo, which I just learned about maybe uh, five, six years ago. The woman standing forth from the right in the back is my father's mother, my grandmother, who perished at Auschwitz. The novel describes the gatherings of the ghetto intellects, intellectsia and the Jewish underworld, as well as the ideological responses of the various political parties, the Zionists, the Communists, and Bundes. Most importantly, it gives a portrait of that section of ghetto society that Rosenfarb knew well from personal experience, the Lodge Ghetto's artistic community. Her portrayal of the tenacity and bravery of this community includes fictionalized portraits of the real-life poet Miriam Ullinover, at whose apartment the writers' group meets, and the painter Israel Lazarovich. Incidentally, it, Lazarovich is the man featured as standing at the forefront of this photo. Uh, if you can, I don't know if you can see, he's holding, he was a painter, and he's holding a portfolio under his arm. Uh, many of Lazarovich's drawings and paintings of the ghetto and, the, um, and of Rumkowski have survived the war and are housed today in the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. Lazarovich himself perished at Auschwitz in August 1944.
questions about the role and value of art and culture in the face of barbarity permeate the narrative of the Tree of Life and fuel debate throughout the novel. Arguments about the so-called insularity of Yiddish literature versus the international quality of European literature. Arguments about the relative merits of Yiddish versus Hebrew as appropriate languages for the Jews. About the value of theater and concerts in the ghetto are all raised and discussed by various characters throughout the novel. One theme in particular arises at crucial moments, namely the significance of Western culture for the Jews. For instance, the elderly literature teacher, Miss Diamond, who is named after the real life Dora Diamond, uh, Franz Kafka's last lover, who was an ardent Yiddishist and whom Chava met in London after the war. Miss Diamond, the fictional one, uses Shakespeare's The Tempest to try to comfort the students in the newly reopened Jewish high school after the Nazi invasion. She believes fervently that culture, that is Western, non-Jewish culture, equals salvation. The students initially respond to the play's love story between Ferdinand and Miranda, but then some of the boys are pulled from their classrooms by the Nazis and sent out to forced labor. After this, None of the remaining students can concentrate on the tempest, which is suddenly as remote and meaningless to them as a fairy tale. Miss Diamond offers her students the fruits of Western civilization as a way of making them forget their present situation. And I'm quoting, <coughs> she wanted them to hold on, as she did, to eternal indestructible values. She was aware of what was going on around them, in their homes and in the city. But in school, at least, all that must be made to fade out of their minds. For only in this manner, she felt, could they acquire the strength and dignity to deal with the storm raging outside. She had therefore begun the first literature lesson by choosing the giant Shakespeare to assist her task. She spoke of Caliban and Prospero. She discussed Prospero's dialogue with Ariel. The students listened to her, but their faces told her that she had not achieved what she desired. That's the end of the quote. Examples such as this force readers to question the value of Western culture in addressing the problems of being Jewish in a world that despises Jews. Miss Diamond turns to non-Jewish texts in an attempt to find comfort and healing in the cultural heritage of Europe, and in doing so, accepts and perpetuates assumptions about the value of that heritage. But the younger generation rejects these assumptions. In every confrontation of this type in the novel, it is the younger generation that is more Jewish, the more inclined to question the humanistic assumptions of its elders about the value and the inclusiveness of Western culture. The Tree of Life is not particularly sentimental in its depiction of the ghetto inhabitants. Rosenfarb's characters may be victims of the Nazis, but that is incidental to their essence. They are victims, but they are not innocents. Their natures partake of all the usual complexities of the human psyche, both good and bad. Rosenfarb's great strength is as a psychological realist, and she is at her best in delineating the personalities of those characters of whom she least approves. Suffering does not make Rosenfarb's <coughs> characters kinder or more noble than they were before. It merely highlights the qualities that were there before the war, and in some cases, turns those qualities into their opposites. At the same time, the Tree of Life never allows us to lose sight of the fact that this is suffering brought on by an outside force, that the ultimate evil belongs to the Nazis. One of Rosenfarb's most psychologically complex characters is Mordechai Chaim Rumkowski, the Jewish boss of the Lodge Ghetto. Rumkowski is a man whose personality and motives have been much debated by historians. 
If Rumkowski does not emerge from Rosenfarb's pages as likable, he does at least appear as knowable. When we first meet him at Samuel Zuckerman's New Year's Eve party, Rumkowski is soliciting funds for the orphanage he runs. This is a picture of him with the staff and the students at the orphanage. Scenes set in the orphanage make it clear that Rumkowski loves the adulation of those who are weaker than he. The old man has a weakness for young girls, and in the culminating episode of the first chapter in which he appears, he attempts to seduce a young girl from the orphanage, Sabinka, whom he has treated to an afternoon at the fairgrounds of Luna Park. Rumkowski's near rape of the innocent 15-year-old Sabinka in the outlying bushes of the park is interrupted by some Polish boys chanting, hep, hep, give it to her, old Jew boy, give it to her. The reminder here is that the Jewish world of pre-war Poland is hedged around with anti-Semitic <coughs> hatred, even before the Germans march into the, into the country. And the irony here is that this same anti-Semitism of the Polish thugs saves the innocent Jewish girl from assault by a Jewish predator. Rosenfarb's Rumkowski is a man with a mission. He sees himself as a modern day Moses, the predestined leader of an entire people. He is a man who is dangerous because he is so completely convinced of his own importance that he can blind himself to any reality. He is ironically an admirer of Hitler. When the Speer starts, he realizes with regret that, as a quote, he now knew clearly what the Germans wanted and what they needed him for. He knew that he would never sit with Hitler at the same table discussing the establishment of a Jewish state. Yet Rumkowski is not an out-and-out -out villain. Convinced as he is that only he can rescue the Jews, he does nevertheless act, at least some of the time, for altruistic reasons. And he can display bravery, as when early on he saves a number of Jews from the hands of the Nazis, despite the fact that he is beaten up for his efforts. And he puts up with the contempt and physical abuse of his Nazi overlords. But as life in the ghetto becomes progressively more desperate, Rumkowski's position becomes ever more untenable, as the Nazis demand that he hand over larger and larger numbers of Jews for deportation to the death camps. Rosenfarb describes in chilling detail the kinds of accommodations with his own conscience that Rumkowski must make in order to justify handing over first the children from his beloved orphanage, then all children under the age of 10, then the sick from the hospitals, the elderly, the Western Jews, the Jews whose partners had been deported before, and so on. In one of the novel's most horrifying accounts of an actual historical event, the Sperre, or house arrest, Rumkowski demands that the mothers of the ghetto willingly give up their children to the Nazis for the good of the collective. And this photo was taken as he actually is making that speech. <coughs> Rosenfarb never personally knew Rumkowski, so his portrait in the Tree of Life is fiction. <coughs> but clearly, it is the moral ambiguity of Rumkowski's position that fascinates her the human kernel of good overlaid with layers of self-delusion, megalomania, and petty cruelty. This propensity for trying to imaginatively get under the skin of characters whom she despises in order to see how they tick occurs in other of Rosenfarb's fictions. For example, the long short story, Edja's Revenge, is told from the point of view of a former capo who after the war must come to terms with the guilt she feels for persecuting her fellow Jews during the Holocaust. The attempt to understand and convey evil from the inside also suggests a wish on the part of the author to come to terms with it, to fictionalize cruelty as a way of defanging the monster. 
But Rosenfarb's presentation of this type of negative uh, character, Jewish character, also has another dimension. It insists on the humanity of the Jews, both for good and evil, and in so doing makes an implicit argument that what happened to the Jews during the Holocaust was an abomination, not because Jews are inherently saintly or inherently evil, but precisely because they are not exempt from all the failings and all the greatness of humanity. All the more reason, then, that they should be treated as equal with other human beings. For this reason, Rosenfarb does not shy away from portraying negative Jewish characters, nor is she reluctant to portray the disintegration and self-delusion of even the most admirable among them such as the well-meaning Samuel Zuckerman. The Tree of Life limits its narrative perspective to the ghetto. It ends with the liquidation of the ghetto and the deportation of all the characters, including Minkowski. <coughs> the death camps that await outside the barbed wire fence of the ghetto are indicated simply by a short inscription. Auschwitz, word stop, undressed, naked, their meaning, their senses, shaven off. Letters expire in the smoke of the crematorium's chimney. This is followed by a series of blank pages and an epilogue. In the epilogue, which is set in Brussels 10 years later, we are told that three of the characters have survived. One of the survivors is the author of the novel that we have just read, and we see her sit down to begin her book with its actual first paragraph. But of the fates of the other characters, we learn nothing. Can we assume that some of them survived? The narrative is silent on this and allows readers to hope that some of those deported to Auschwitz may have survived. Silence allows for irresolution, which in turn allows for hope. But when she was asked about this in an interview, the author herself gave no hope. As far as she was concerned, all the characters, except for the three mentioned in the epilogue, perished at Auschwitz, because, as she said, that's the way it was. It took Chava Rosenfarb 22 years to write The Tree of Life, which she began shortly after settling in Montreal in 1950. By that time, she was already a well-known poet in Yiddish language literary circles. This is uh, translations of her poetry into English. Rosenfarb spent 50 years of her life in Montreal, a city where Yiddish had once been the most widely spoken language after French and English. There, she continued to write in Yiddish, the language in which she published two more novels, Bocciani and Letters to Russia. She was also a frequent contributor to Avrom Sutzkever's prestigious Yiddish language literary journal, The Golden Kite. And it is with a few words about Yiddish that I would like to end. The Holocaust put an end to many things, but one of the most tragic losses that can be attributed to it is, in my opinion, the flourishing of Yiddish language and literature and the rich cultural heritage that it nourished. It was a slow death over time, a death by a thousand diminishments. After the war, there were still many who could speak and read the language, although most speakers had perished in the Holocaust. But by the 1960s, Yiddish no longer took pride of place as a Jewish language, not even in Montreal, which boasted a vibrant Yiddish-speaking Jewish community that persisted long after it had vanished elsewhere. And still today, the city has a Yiddish theater, a functioning Yiddish theater and Yiddish schools. But while the Jewish community of Montreal remains bilingual, its bilingualism today more, is more likely to be French and English rather than English and Yiddish. This change in the fortunes of Yiddish can be traced in the trajectory of Rosenfarb's career. As time went on, she had become increasingly aware that night had stolen into the garden of Yiddish that Yiddish was fading as a secular and literary language in Montreal and in the rest of the world. 
The awareness of decline may have come gradually, but it was a shock <coughs> nevertheless. The Yiddish newspaper of Montreal, Der Canada Odler, was forced to close for lack of readers. Attendance at Yiddish lectures at Montreal's Jewish Public Library and at Yiddish <coughs> language Holocaust commemorations diminished dramatically. For Rosenfarb, the greatest blow was the demise of the Golden Echai, Avram Sotskever's respected Yiddish literary journal to which he had contributed stories, essays, and travelogues for nearly 40 years and which suddenly ceased publication in 1990. The folding of the Golden Echai threw her into a profound depression because it meant that she no longer had a venue for publishing what she wrote in Yiddish. So what was the point of even continuing to write in that language or continuing to write at all? Where writers are concerned, language is destiny. Rosenfarb's decision to write The Tree of Life and her other novels in, Yidd in Yiddish had been a fateful one, given that it contributed to the obscurity of the work. Yet it was an unavoidable decision, not only because Yiddish was the author's mother tongue and the language in which she felt most comfortable, but also because of her desire to memorialize the lost Jewish community of Lodz, a community that had lived its life in Yiddish. I would like to end then with Rosenfarb's own words about her lost language and its significance to her <coughs> as a writer about the Holocaust. What affects me most, she wrote, is the continual sense of isolation that I feel as a survivor, an isolation enhanced by my being a Yiddish writer. I feel myself to be an anachronism, wandering across a page of history on which I do not belong. If writing is a lonely profession, then the Yiddish writer's loneliness has an added dimension. Her readership has perished. Her language has gone up with the smoke of the crematoria. She creates in a vacuum, almost without an audience, out of fidelity to a lost community whose language this was, as if to prove that Nazism did not succeed in extinguishing its last breath, that it is still alive. Creativity is a life-affirming activity. Lack of response to creativity and being condemned to write for the desk drawer is a stifling, destructive experience. Sandwiched between these two states of mind struggles the spirit of the Yiddish writer. I do not know where the spirit of this particular Yiddish writer has gone. I know only that I miss the great intelligence and warmth of heart that allowed it to walk the earth for 87 years in the shape of my mother. I continue to translate her work and I continue to hope that her words will live on in the minds of her readers because as long as she is read, she is alive. Thank you. Please wait until uh, one of us will hand you the microphone. Thank you. I'm curious, where is it that you teach now, and how did you come into what is your profession at this point in time? Uh, I teach at the University of Lethbridge which uh, is in southern Alberta, and I guess everyone is now aware of, where, of Alberta because we just had a, a very bad fire in the north of the province. Um, and how I I've always uh, was interested in literature from the time I was very young, and I got my, um, I, I wanted to be a writer and a, to have something to do with literature, and I love to tell people what I think. So I decided the best uh, occupation was to become professor. So I got my PhD at McGill. Um, I'm originally from Montreal, and then I got the job in Lethbridge. I have a loud voice. <laughs> Thank you so much.
much. It was just a beautiful homage oh, to so many things. So I wanted to ask you how your mother viewed Isaac Bashevis Singer. Because I understand that Isaac Bashevis Singer, singer, while he was extremely famous to the American literary crowd, um, was not particularly well regarded among Yiddish writers. And I wondered if your mother shared that view and if you'd like to share her, her views. Um, my, my mother knew Bashevis very well, and I, actually I met him. And in Yiddish, is usually, usually referred to as Bashevis, um, which was his middle name. Uh, yeah, the, the general feeling among Yiddish writers was uh, Bashevis, when he was writing for the forwards in Yiddish, he didn't spend a lot of time fixing up his language. So it wasn't uh, elegant because he expected it to be, once he became well known, he expected it to be translated into English. And that's really, uh, you know, where, where his heart was. So uh, as a stylist in Yiddish, he wasn't particularly well regarded. Uh, he was also considered to be a writer of Shund. Uh, Shund is uh, sort of pornographic uh, stuff because of all the, um, because of the way he wrote subject matter that most properly brought up uh, European Yiddish speakers would not have touched. It was considered cheap, uh, cheap literature, cheap subject matter, not cheap. At the same time, I have to say that he was um, certainly respected, and especially once he won the Nobel Prize. I mean, uh, Yiddish, everybody was very excited because it was thought that was given an injection into uh, Yiddish literature. And uh, finally, a Yiddish writer had been recognized by the wider world, and that was very, very important. So I would say it, it was mixed. Um, my mother liked him on a personal level, um, but I think she shared some of the um, complaints uh, that, that other Yiddish writers had about him. However, she has a, a very interesting essay that compares um, Bashevis to Sholomash. Uh, and so she, 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 I think on the whole, she respected him. Thank you. Is a uh, couple questions. Uh, is Goldie uh, the name you were given when you're born? Is that a traditional Yiddish name? And secondly, uh, that guy uh, Rumkowski, did he uh, was he killed at Auschwitz? And has there been uh, any other writings other than what she did about his life and what a bad, mixed up character he really was? Uh, my name. Uh, I, I pointed out my father's mother. Um, her name was Golda, and that's my name. Right. And when I was born, my father decided that he wanted to, he wanted his daughter to get off on an English foot, so he anglicized it to Goldie. But the name is Golda. Um, and and I, I have to say that I, I grew up in a community of um, Holocaust survivors, and a lot of the children of these survivors are named after people uh, who died in the Holocaust. Um, as for Rumkowski, there have been many books. There was, um, I, I don't remember how long ago, uh, a man called Leslie Epstein wrote, I think, I think the novel is called King of the Jews, about Rumkowski. And just recently, maybe a year or two ago, there was a Swedish novel um, translated into English, and the name of that I don't remember, by a Swedish writer, uh, also about Rumkowski. And there have been historical accounts as well, and there have been memoirs. Um, the story I told of Rumkowski having a, a weakness for, a younger, for young girls actually comes from um, a personal memoir by another woman who survived the Lodge Ghetto who worked with him. And that was a, a commonly uh, said about him. So um, there, there's been a lot written about him it, because he was part of the Judenrat, right? The, um, the Jews who were set in place to rule over other Jews by the Nazis. And in many ways, he, uh, he gets criticized, but he also, his mission was to save as much as he could of the Lodge Ghetto. And there have been people who would argue, and I think my mother at one point, though, when she was asked, also said this. He succeeded because 
not that community, there were survivors from Lodge, more than you might have expected. And, and the ghetto, the Lodge ghetto, because he made it um, so important to the Nazis, because everybody worked, you had to work, right? He made it so important to them that they um, did not destroy it earlier. They, they waited till August 1944. So it's, it's a mixed um, uh, result, right, in terms of whether he was a villain or whether he was, uh, like he thought of himself as a savior. And he was, in the end, sent off to Auschwitz, on one of the last um, um, liquidations, uh, deportations from the ghetto. And there are a number of stories that he was, in fact, killed on route to Auschwitz by Jews who were angry. I, I don't think that's ever been confirmed. But he certainly died um, in the gas, in gas chambers of Auschwitz. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. You. I was just curious. What was it like living in that household? Did you all speak English together? Or was it all uh, Yiddish? And also, were you aware of Holocaust details <clears throat> as you were growing up? Your mother touched on it in the movie earlier, that some children were not told anything. That's true. But my mother was a writer. <laughs> And uh, yes, I, w I was always aware of it. And also, I think growing up in Montreal, like all my friends were the children of survivors. It was a whole community. So it was impossible not to be aware of it. And then I went to um, one of the Jewish day, school, day schools in Montreal, where it wasn't taught. But again, I mean, the, the students there were, um, a lot of them, not all, uh, were children of survivors. So it was very much in the air. My own family um, is maybe a microcosm of the kinds of attitudes that survived, sort of diametrically opposed attitudes that survivors had. My mother always talked about it. She wanted me to know. But my father is also a Holocaust survivor. I mean, he survived the ghetto too, and he didn't want to know. He didn't want to have anything to do with Jewish nothing. And so there was a big fight, for instance, about sending me to a Jewish school. He didn't want, she insisted, and when my brother came along, he said, okay, you sent the girl to the Jewish school, I'm sending my son to another school. So it, it was, um, I, and I think, and I've been reading um, memoirs and, and attitudes of survivors to their own experiences. <coughs> And some of them really wanted, they wanted to go into the future. They didn't want to remember what the past was like. And my father was like that. Whereas others want, held on to what had been and, and didn't want to let it go. And my mother was like that. So um, there was a, a certain amount of tension. We spoke Yiddish. My grandmother survived, unusually, my mother's mother. Uh, so, and uh, she was, uh, she never learned English. So. The, in, the language of my home was Yiddish, but my father again, uh, he had to, <laughs> when I was about six, he said, that's enough, no more Yiddish, it's going to be English from now on, or French is okay too. <laughs> so I have one last question also. So today, what is your life like in, in Canada, in Alberta, in terms of the, the Yiddish and Jewish community that's there? Do you still speak Yiddish with your friends, or do you, obviously you're still translating your mother's work, but... What is your own personal life like these days relative to all this? Well, I'm sorry to say that Lethbridge um, does not have a lot of Jews. In fact, no, I think the only other one is right there is my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I, when I'm there, I, I, I really have no uh, Jewish life at all. And my mother used to live with us. So as long as she was living with us, uh, she and I would speak in Yiddish. But now that she's gone, I, haven't, I, I don't speak with anyone, I, and I find that my spoken Yiddish um, is deteriorated because I, I was just interviewed for the Forbes and they wanted to make it in, in Yiddish, and I really had a hard time expressing myself because it, if you don't speak a language, it goes. So, um, but my passive knowledge, like I read without any problem, and, and that, that's still okay. Uh, so what, what I do to get a, at least a taste of Jewish life is uh, go to Toronto, a lot, <laughs> as much as we can. 
Any more questions? <coughs> what are you actually teaching at the university? I teach uh, 19th century British and American literature. And very occasionally, I teach a course in Jewish literature. But very occasionally, I have no Jewish students at all. Here's one last question. Um, I don't know if you were aware of it, but there was a documentary on your father at our film festival this year. Yes, I, I, I heard about it. Oh, that. you did. OK, so how, what, was the, the, what was it like in your household? What was going on? I mean, you know, just everything with, with being the child of a survivor, with your father, who was quite an activist. And it must have been an interesting household. Uh, you know the Chinese expression, you should live in interesting times? <laughs> That's what it was like. <laughs> it, it was, uh, my father is a, is a story unto himself, very complicated man. And, um, yeah. Well, if there are no more questions, um, please join me in thanking uh, Professor Morgan.